Okay, well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome to our uh, biologicals webinar series. This is our thir the third webinar in our series. And uh, I just want to cover a couple things before we get started. Um, first of all, everyone is muted. Um, so if you have a question, uh, please put that in the Q and A uh, panel, um, or you could you could send a chat to the panelists too. Um, I'm I am going to be posting some links that we'll be discussing a little bit um, in the chat, uh, so you can take a look at that. Uh, but I'll also be sending those out um, in a follow up email with a recording. Um, so if you if you can't copy those out because you're watching the presentation, don't worry about it. We'll send them to you. Um, so I think that's all I had with that. I'm going to have Keith, uh, introduce Jim here and I'll, uh, get out of your way. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate that. Uh, and folks, we're so glad that you joined us today. We've uh, been having a great time doing these biological webinars and very excited about what we have for you today. Uh, our guest today is uh, Jim Ristow. Uh, Jim is, uh, well, I would consider Jim a friend, uh, not, uh, you know, we met probably three or four years ago. So I'll give you a little bit of background on Jim and then how we kind of came to know him and, and been working with him. So Jim's been worked in conservation all his life. Uh, he's worked for fish and game. He's worked for as a fishing guide on the Missouri River. Uh, Jim lives up in Chamberlain, South Dakota, right on the river. Uh, has recently been the sustainability director with the South Dakota Corn Board. Uh, and is now still working with the, the corn board up there, but uh, in a little bit different capacity with kind of a bit more of a concentrated project with uh, a few counties there in his area. So Jim's got a deep background in conservation, loves the land, and uh, just really has a passion and a desire to help people make their land better for future generations. So Jim, I would say you have a very close association to our mission statement, which is regenerating God's creation for future generations. And so uh, we first really met Jim uh, three years ago, uh, the summer of 2019. So three and a half years ago, coming up on four, uh, we had a composting workshop here in Bladen. And I know some of the folks that are watching this were here for that. Uh, Jerry Gillespie and Christine Jones from Australia, they came, we did a composting workshop and Jim was there, and I was really impressed after the event because Jim took these concepts. He went home, and where a lot of us just did like, well, that was good information. Maybe someday I'll do that. I think Jim was doing it in his head on the way home, I think, because <laughs> he put these things into practice right away. And so we wanted Jim to come on and share some of the things that he learned from that composting workshop as well as, as some of the things that he's learned about soil biology from working with all of the farmers up there in South Dakota. And, and um, another thing about Jim is he's just constantly learning. And Jim, I think you said you've made it through the first of Elaine Ingham's session. I think there's three courses. You made it through her first course and are working on the others. Uh, that uh, and, and that that's no small task. I have not done that, but talking to people that have, it is it is a course. It's a college course. Uh, we can see your microscope setting in the background there behind you. So uh, you can, you know, feel free to share a little bit about what you've been learning from Dr. Ingham, uh, as well as, you know, from Christine Jones and Jerry Gillespie. And the, the links uh, to the recordings of that composting workshop that we did three and a half years ago, Jonathan's going to be posting those. Uh, Jim will be referring to some recipes and all that's going to be on the on the chat. And so before I turn it over, many of you watched our one last week on the Johnson Sioux method of composting, which is a great way to go. Jim's very familiar with that. He's going to be what Jim's going to describe uh, in at least in part of his talk is what we did with Jerry Gillespie. And it's a different way to compost, not necessarily right, wrong or otherwise. But it's a different way to approach it and uh, try to achieve some of the same results. So we want to open your mind up that there are many options, many pathways to get to the same end result of having a healthier soil ecosystem through improving our biology. So with all that, I am going to turn it over to Mr. Jim Ristow. Take it away, Jim. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Keith. And um, yeah, I was 
I was thinking about that event that we came down to in Bladen and, and uh, you're exactly right. I was, I was kind of posting on the way home wondering <laughs> what did I put together to, you know, what, what do we need to do here to make this work? And I, what impressed me was if, if it was right, what they were saying, what Christine Jones and Jerry Gillespie were saying about our ability to use on-farm resources, it, it solves so many of the environmental problems we hear about. And I just felt like we have to get an understanding yeah. of this because it, it starts to, you know, we aren't talking about water quality issues and, and, and runoff and all those negatives with agriculture. So any, any farmer could adopt some of these practices if they could get partway down the path even with this, it would have a huge impact on our environment, which I have always been concerned about. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's great. And while you're getting your PowerPoint loaded up yeah. there, I'll just give a touch of background. This, so this Jerry Gillespie that came over from Australia and put this on, his, his main thing that he does is he works with municipalities. He's from Australia, but he works all over the world and teaching them how to compost all the waste that they generate. And a lot of it being food scraps and food waste. And so uh, a lot of what Jim's going to show you here is if you make a connection with your local school or your local hospital or local grocery store, you could potentially compost a lot of their food scraps instead of having that go into uh, the, the public landfill because, you know, that's a stupid thing to put in a landfill is something that yeah. is easy to compost. So um, yeah, take it away, Jim. All right. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Kind of my journey since attending that uh, event at function of our soils and and composting can get us there uh, it, or or at least move us in the right direction because all we're really doing is feeding our microbes. That's what composting is about: getting the right community and feeding them, keeping them fed, and letting them do their job. But I will. Uh, refer to a couple other resources. I am not the expert. I, I am really pretty green on this, but I, I do have a thirst for knowledge and understanding how we can adopt this. And I'm really interested in how we can do these things. A lot of these things are not new. They've been going on for thousands of years. It's maybe new to us in the United States uh, because you know we're really only into doing agriculture the way we do it here and uh there was people doing it uh way better than us probably before that it's just uh rediscovery of some of those things so jerry gillespie of course we've he's got a website that uh, i'm sure the link will be uh available to you also uh the the johnson sue which is the information from dr johnson is uh, you've heard mentioned and to discuss that at length last week, great composting method. Uh, I've, I've got some pictures of that here in the presentation. I did some of that this year. And then I have taken Dr. Elaine's Soil Food Web School. Uh, terrific information. I mean, if it's surprising if you're at this webinar today, you probably know a lot more than you think you do about how soils work and how nutrients uh, work with the plant in the soil and how all that comes together. Uh, but she, she really does a great job of driving that home and getting you to believe in the system because they've shown that it works. And, uh, you know, basically creating a, a really, really complex uh, system that's happening biologically and putting it into a format that just about anybody can understand and and learn you know kind of the functions of these critters that are in the soil you aren't going to learn latin names and all it's just groups and families and functions and it's really not that hard to do once you get a handle on it and, and set your mind to it that that you want to learn and then uh, another book that I read actually a couple of years ago, but now I've, I've rediscovered it in my Kindle books and it's a uh, regenerative grower's guide to garden amendments. And, and this is really a, a, it's kind of a gardening book, but it shows it, it, it really uh, 
takes the Korean natural farming methods and makes them accessible. The, the methods really uh, focus on using your local biology and how to collect it and how to grow it and then how to apply it and get it, get it onto the land. Um, when I left the workshop in Bladen, I came home and here we go. I Right away, I'm going to make fish hydrolysis. So the, <laughs> I started saving all the fish guts from the cleaning station here in Chamberlain. We've got a great sport fishery. There's, there's uh, you know, 55 gallon drums of fish cleanings every day in the summer during the peak fishing season. And uh, so I was collecting that and freezing them. And uh, there on the left is a is my one of my fish hydrolysis attempts. Uh, it went fairly well. Also, uh, I started a worm bin, vermicomposting, and, and Jerry is one of the world's experts on that. He didn't talk about that a lot at the, at the event, but we've had a lot of email communication as a result of that event. And uh, he strongly encourages people to uh, get a worm bin going, at least, you know, cycle your own kitchen waste, uh, if not take that even further and scale it. Uh, vermicompost is one of the most valuable uh, soil amendments that we can use. And, and the reasons are because of what's in it and what the process that that material has been through. Um, Jerry Gillespie teaches, uh, and, and Christine Jones, were encouraging us to adopt a, uh, a method of composting called the SPICE method, static pile inoculant compost. I forget what the E stands for. Uh, anyway, extract. Extract. Okay. So that is referring to the to the inoculant that you spray on the pile as you build it. And this is my brother. When I got home, we said, "Let's do this. Let's build a pile." So we had manure in the in the calf feed lot, just right there in the background. This is an old silage pit that we used to make silage and feed cattle in the winter time. You know, and it was a a pit. Uh, work great. It worked great for this. Just layering in, in materials. He put in a scoop of manure and then layer in some, it's oats and peas straw actually uh, from the year before from a cover crop we had had. Um, and I, as he was layering, I was uh, spraying with the compost inoculant, which we'll discuss a little bit. I won't go into detail how it's made, but those recipes are all uh, from Jerry Gillespie's uh, documents that that will provide for you uh this is hopefully this is coming through but once we layered all the piles we kind of um started mixing them and and just making sure we had a good thorough mix and that the inoculant was throughout the pile and uh it's just some footage of that there in the background you can see the oats and peas stacks my brother still uses the heston stacker and uh, what a great way to, you know, have some materials on hand. So uh, that, that pile started heating up right away. Uh, I, was, I was really impressed with it. But the next thing after, after mixing and layering is, is to cover the pile with a large plastic sheet and, uh, you know, just a, a silage cover type sheet. and and uh, this is different than what you would learn in most composting methods, you know, keeping everything aerobic, aerobic meaning access to plenty of oxygen. Uh, and, and there's good reasons for that. But this particular method, you are actually targeting what are termed facultative microbes. And, and those are microbes that can thrive in both aerobic and anaerobic conditions. So we're specifically going after, and the inoculant is kind of geared for the same thing to make sure that that uh, class of microbes is really doing the bulk of the work in the pile. And uh, as a result, you, you end up with a compost that has that microbe community, but even more importantly, it has what are termed biostimulants which are chemical signalers to, uh, to the biological community that kind of trigger this quorum sensing concept where 
when when there's enough of us we'll do our we'll we'll then we're gonna go it's go time when when there's enough of us to do our to do our thing and there's a lot of beneficial microbes that we aren't seeing the benefits um because they they never they never find any buddies there's never enough of them there to trigger the quorum sensing um activity so these biostimulants are supposedly in this compost material or you know it's not so much the microbes it's these biostimulants that we're after so that's a little bit different as a byproduct you're getting plenty of biology because i've tested it and we'll we'll go through that but just another shot of the pile uh there is some construction considerations uh you'd like to leave a kind of a a hollow area in the top so that the water collects and then kind of recirculates in there uh, as, as, it, as it evaporates, then kind of cycles back through. Um, and with this pile, this, is, this was our first attempt of making use out of it. I took a tote and cut the lid out and I just took a scoop of that compost. You can see it's, it's pretty well broke down. Uh, this is about uh, well, this is actually the following year. So that had sat all winter. We built the pile in July, and let it sit all winter, and then made some applications the following spring. And just, you know, kind of using what's on the farm. That was, I believe, an old fanning mill screen that worked pretty good, actually, to, to keep, uh, you know, kind of the pre-filter out of the tank so we didn't plug up the, the, the hole in the bottom right, out, right off the bat. But I, I, I've kind of just flooded with some water and and uh, let that soak for a little bit. And, and that's kind of what the extract method is with this spice compost, is you really don't want to aerate it uh, because then you're altering that microbial community back to anaerobic, or I'm sorry, aerobic microbes. And you really want those facultative microbes. So they, so the, and you want those, uh, biostimulants, which apparently come out pretty easily with a water extraction. So um, I don't, I think what, if I had this to do over again, which we will do, I, I, I think I won't use nearly as much compost and do a little more just light stirring with a, with a paddle of some sort and then, and then collect the extract and, and put that right on into a sprayer. Uh, this is our, my makeshift filtering, uh, <laughs> I was pretty proud of this actually. So the water was coming out of there nicely, the extract, and, and right through an old burlap sack. And I think that was a coffee bag, coffee bean bag. And uh, and then uh, putting it into another container, which is pretty well filtered and, and uh, didn't cause us any problems as far as, as plugging up. And it's diluted. I did use uh, about, oh, at the time we had a 500 gallon sprayer and I was trying to use about a uh, about five gallons per 500 gallons of water. Since then I we my brother-in-law had this sitting back in the shelter belt and it was still in pretty darn good shape and he said yeah you can use that so I I brought this to the farm and this is now our dedicated biological amendment applicator. Um, I did mention that I went to Elaine, or I'm taking Elaine Ingham's class. I'm I'm uh, I'm about uh, better than halfway through actually. Uh, I've taken all the classwork, I've taken all the microscope work, and now it's more application. And the final project is you actually do uh, and measure and evaluate the effects of what you made in your compost, get it out on the land through an extract and then and then be able to uh, document the results through a biological analysis. But um, they teach the aerated compost extraction that most people are familiar with. I threw this in just because I wanted people to see that uh, you can do a good extraction with just air and you don't have to have a you know twenty thirty thousand dollar extraction. I mean that helps to to scale and get things going. And you know if you kind of have a, a a big operation where you need to cut a lot of acres, but even something as simple as this uh, can give you a, a good quality compost extract. And that that's just a, a uh, something I built. 
it's a, a hot tub blower and plumbed it through the bottom of this uh, B bottom tank and, and there's my extraction going on. And this is the, what the, how they teach it in the soil food web school. So that's fully aerobic. And uh, you let that run for 20 minutes. Then you can see the, the uh, you let it sit and settle and the things that float go to the top and the things that sink go to the bottom. A lot of sand and rocks and what's left over goes to the bottom, but then you can take a pretty, pretty nice liquid out of the side. And uh, so that's, that's, um, that's probably the typical thing. Well, I built this because I wanted not only something for my own use around the yard, but I, I wanted to see if I could design something that I could scale up. So now where I went from that then is, is to a, uh, a 500 gallon tank. I, I was able to use a similar type pump. These are cheap, you know, 150, 200 bucks and plumbed it with PVC. And I think I've got a little video here that kind of follows how that works. Uh, this is actually making an extract with this, with uh, some compost. Um, I think two five gallon buckets of compost in this 500 gallon tank. You see it does a heck of a job. It really does a wonderful job. Uh, knocking the microbes off the compost. And I gotta give, a uh, fella credit for showing me this. Jim Williams from um, St. Charles, South Dakota has been doing this for, you know, close to eight or 10 years now. And, and he's been through all the experimentation and, and I, I was able to see his operation at his farm and, and, and took what I learned from him to build my own uh, extraction. Uh, we've got some work to do. This did not uh, drain as well as I expected to get the compost back out of here. I, I think what I need to do is just not have so many 90 degree corners and it would it would flow pretty easily to, to empty it. You have to clean everything out once you use it and and just don't let things dry. And and because that'll instantly those microbes will go to work and start making a mess of stuff. Uh, they'll leave glues. This is another picture then from there, pulling out of the side, I kind of went from the tank back to the, or the sprayer tank back to the extraction. And that had bubbled for 45 minutes or so. And there again, we let it settle and then, and then pulled out of the, the middle of the tank. So the compost is settled in the bottom and all the floating stuff is on top. And you don't want to, of course, run all the floating stuff into your tank. And I do have an inline filter on that that catches anything that does go through. Uh, but um, really having not a lot of problems at all on the sprayer, I did do some modification to it. Um, again, lessons from Jim Williams that he said, you know, get all your filtering done before you get it in that tank in the sprayer. And then don't do any filtering at your nozzles or anything like that because it, you, you just blow everything through. So I use the biggest nozzles I could get my hands on. Uh, I believe there's one every 40 inches. So we, we actually remove some nozzles and then use these big wide 80 degree fan nozzles or even more, I think they're 120 degree fans. I've got a video of that coming up. Uh, and that, that eliminates a lot of the problems in the field. So you're not constantly having to get off the tractor and go clean nozzles. I mean, I, I did a little of that, but not, not nearly as when I did it when I first started, you know, trying to go through little nozzles. <clears throat> this was applying on soybeans last summer, compost extract, and the sun was just just nice. And I, I took a short little video. Hopefully it'll play here. And, uh, you know, getting a nice, I, I'm getting about 20 gallons an acre down, 10 gallons of compost, 500 gallons of water. Uh, and I uh, feel like that, that's good. Now, I'd like to get this into the furrow. Uh, we did get some products into the furrow with beans and the corn, but on small grains, I want, and we're working on trying to get that in with our small grains as well. I, I really think that that's gonna be the, uh, 
the way to you know get the best results is get it into the furrow with the seed and then that seed is establishing that relationship right from the get-go and uh oops i'll go back to uh i did test that static pile compost and uh this is from b crop of course you maybe heard about b crop they can do a a biological analysis. This is not what you would get from a Lane's class. This is more uh, directed towards identification of the actual microbes and you get an idea of the fungi and bacteria. I don't know that that's really the most valuable information to me. I, I kind of do like looking at these numbers at the bottom that indicate you know, that you have good diversity. That was impressive to me. And, and the functionality isn't too bad. So it, it's a really diverse compost it, and it's gonna provide the function. And then you can read through those reports and you know 75% of them are cycling nitrogen, you know, all those things. Um, this is, this is a, re, uh, a, a minimum of what is taught by Dr. Elaine's soil food web uh, of what she has, termed and, and actually trademarked the term biologically complete compost. And you want to have certain levels within that compost, including uh, bacteria, uh, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes, and all, all of those in there, actinobacteria to certain levels are, are okay. Um, these, uh, this is the whole, food chain basically of smaller organisms that you need to have working in your soil. And we're really trying to reestablish these at levels that can uh, allow them to do that. Of course, every situation is different. Every soil is different and in, into what they're going into. You really got to watch the chemistry. Uh, if you put this in with a whole bunch of fertilizer, they aren't going to do what they are capable of doing. So it's, it's really a balance of trying to figure out, okay, how much of risk can I take here? Uh, I want to try this. I want to learn it. I want to back off on how much fertilizer I need. But really, if we get these microbes in there with the seed, with plenty of food, they have a chance. And then maybe we get our fertilizer on a little bit later if we can test for that, you know, whether it's with sap tests or some of these, these newer uh, in-season fertility applications as well as every time you go out there and do anything with a with a chemical come back in with the compost and it, with the with the foliar and reestablish that population back on the plant and and uh over time it's expected that you'll need less and less of the chemistry and, and more and more of the biology and and uh hopefully increase yields as well uh Here's some more of the uh, composting that I've done in the backyard at, at my house in Chamberlain. Uh, this is uh, the Johnson Sioux on the right and, and maybe more of the static pile method on the left. But I kind of built them uh, about the same time in the spring. And uh, unfortunately, it was a really hot, dry summer and both pretty well dried out, which it, it just became tough to, to get them, keep them hydrated. I tried wrapping them and things and, 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 uh, but they did make really good compost, you know, looking at it through the microscope. Now I saw, you know, I took some of this this fall and took it in and it looked really good. Uh, the Johnson Sioux pile actually had a layer that kind of was just, uh, it didn't really compost. It just kind of made a gooey anaerobic layer about a third of the way down. But everything under that was really, really nice and composted well. So I'm not exactly sure if that's the ideal result, but I, I was actually pretty happy with it for not putting a whole lot of effort into, into these two piles. Uh, this was the Johnson Sioux, and you like to see this. I did spray a little bit of the foundational fungi from Elevate Egg onto this pile, and sure enough, uh, 
you know they're there when you can see them and they'll they'll pop up overnight and be gone the next day it's just kind of really interesting uh just some some pictures of more the thermophilic composting method that uh elaine teaches and others uh um uh, zach wright teaches this method as well it's it's a little more labor you got to pay attention to your temperatures and turn it when it needs it. it, it it's a turning pile to keep it aerated. But it, I thought this was, you know, really pretty interesting. I started started the pile on June 18th, and and 40 days later, it had reduced to about you know two thirds, and and was actually pretty good compost at that point. I started a a second pile. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> this is a, a second pile where I used that static pile compost from the farm or and and I use that as the as kind of the starter or the nitrogen component of this pile <coughs> on the left and also uh, some fresh cut alfalfa. This pile really took off. I, I didn't probably have enough high carbon. Could have probably used a little bit more you know, old dry hay or leaves or something in there. But in three days, it went to that. So these microbes have some power. <laughs> and uh, just it's I've learned so much by watching this and understanding how how nutrients flow. And uh, this carbon to nitrogen thing is real. It makes a difference. You get the balance right that the microbes want and they do their job. And I think that's really what we're trying to do with cover crops as well, is layering those materials in carbon and nitrogen that allow the microbes to feed and do their job. And it'll make soil. And uh, why, why can't this alfalfa in this, you know, have everything it needs to do that out in the field? It happens just great right here. And then 27 days later, I'm sorry, I got a tickle in my throat, talking too much. Uh, I was pretty happy with that in the, the short amount of time. And it wasn't long after that, we had some freezing weather. So I, I kind of covered the pile and, and tried to protect it. I did bring some <clears throat> small batch indoors and this was a picture I took two days ago. So that's ready to go. Ready to ready for use. Looks good under the microscope. This is one of my makeshift ways of just kind of storing the pile. <clears throat> it'll freeze, but it'll all come back to life in the spring with with moisture. You don't want it to saturate, uh, but you you know you do want to kind of keep it from drying out and protect it thermally somehow. The other thing I've done is put some in a uh, in a tote sack. You know, a seed seed bag. Actually, I'm using a green cover seed uh tote bag then that works great for uh storing compost and zach wright uh suggested that as well as you know poke some holes in the bottom of it so it can breathe a little bit and and that you can winter compost that way and i like to test the compost and a couple of experiments this is like in uh you know february a year ago we don't get a whole lot of sunlight in my basement but uh just enough to things to go, you know, plants like this stuff. And it helps verify to me that, that uh, I'm not, you know, doing anything bad. Uh, germination is, is really quite excellent. That's corn in the middle with, I think there was actually some soybeans in there, but this, this is what, if you pull that up, look at how the root structure is just throughout the whole pile. It's unbelievable. And I'm sure you have seen this where you spilled grain in the yard and it creates kind of almost a turf. And uh, if you dig up that stuff, the root structure is just massive. And I think we, that's, uh, just look how that could aerate our soils if we could get that going on. Uh, a couple more pictures of the rhizophagy cycle, which of course, Dr. James White has been talking about. It just blows my mind every time I listen to him. Uh, Christine Jones as well talks about 
this is how you see if it's working is pull up a plant look at the root and see if you have that dreadlock appearance and uh i was pretty tickled to see this in corn and this is this is from my garden uh which was an old sandbox when the kids all grew up we don't need the sandbox anymore so i just started throwing some compost and spraying whatever i planted and i'm not busting the bin in my garden but I'm really, this is almost more thrilling to me to see that, <laughs> than having to deal with all that garden produce, but uh, really happy with it. So this is, uh, this is my, my brother who puts up with me and all my experiments and, uh, you know, he's, he's the one making a living doing this and he allows me to go out there and play and try these things, but we're trying to learn stuff and we're seeing some results. He's not as skeptical as he once was. Uh, you know, I'll come up with something that'll throw us off, I'm sure. But uh, when you can see that in your soil and, and uh, you know, put a spade in there and you, and you just, it really warms the heart and you know you're on the right track. And, uh, you know, around the, my wife even is not so angry about all my vermicost, <laughs> vermicompost and fish hydrolysis sitting around in the garage. Or in the ba bathroom basement, actually, one batch that it was probably the best batch I made, hooked it up to the vent. Uh, <laughs> but she puts up with it when you can spray the the plants and the landscape, and and uh, you know, it, it's working. So I think that's what I have. Uh, I don't know anything, Keith. That uh, yeah, no, that was <laughs> great, Jim, and just just a. Full disclaimer, Green Cover is not recommending that you make fish hydrolysate in your wife's bathroom. Just, just so we're clear on this. We don't. Well, it's my bathroom, but it's her house. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, that could get out of hand. Um, you know, one of the things that first strikes me, and we've got we got some great questions that we're going to jump into here. But Jim, one of the things that strikes me is to my to my count, you talked about four different things at least. You know, you, you've done Johnson Sue, you did the, the spice compost, like, you know, Dr. Jones and Jerry Gillespie showed us, you're doing the thermophilic turn deal. And then you're also doing the fish hydrolysate. And, and I mean, we could spend a whole yeah. session on just each one of those, but I, I really like the fact that you are demonstrating that there's more than one way to get to the same end result. So, so don't get hung up on, you have to do it this way. You have to use this material to get your compost. Nature has a way of breaking all that down and getting you to the same point with, with different methods. And so uh, I, I would think that you would agree that there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong method. There's going to be different ones that are going to be better for different people. It depends on their yeah. context. The, what attracted me about the spice compost was it didn't require a lot of work. Mm -hmm. you, you take, you know four or five hours one day and build it and you walk away a year later you have it okay i don't have to think too hard to do that if i get my inoculant right and 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 that that's really uh and it, it produces a, a stable product as well that you use uh you know so that that was attractive the the johnson sue is kind of along those lines as well in my mind yeah um, yeah, and and so let's jump into the questions because there are a number yeah. of questions about the spice compost. And folks, we don't have time to completely describe that, that whole process. So the, the links that we provided in the chat, and these will all be emailed out to you as well. So don't worry about it if you don't get them all copied. There's the, the whole video recording of, of what Jim and I went to when Dr. Jones was here in Bladen. It's, it's got recipe sheets, it's got step-by-steps, and so it's got all that information, so you can go back later and look at that, uh, but we've got several questions here. Jeremy's got a couple of questions, Jim, about that spice compost method. Uh, he, he's asking, is it a hot compost, which means does it heat up, and then are you adding some inoculant to it? Yeah, it as we build it, I'm spraying inoculant and I'm trying to remember the ratio. It was like uh, one liter per ton. Uh, it seems to me that that's kind of what was recommended. Yeah, and, it, and it's on that recipe sheet yeah. that's listed here. Yeah. 
you have to go through the process of making it. So it involves a, uh, a lactobacillus base serum, which you do. It takes about five to seven days to make that. And then you put it through a further ferment. Uh, so you need a fermentation vat of some sort to make the actual inoculant. And in that, you're putting in some seawater and kelp, you know, different things that yeah. diversify that. And, and then that's what you spray on this compost pile. Yes, it will heat up and, uh, and it, it stays hot for quite a while. In fact, I, that same pile is still hot. It's still hot way down. I mean, it, there's some snow melt where it's breathing or it's, it's kind of kept some, you know, some, some area that's not frozen, even mm -hmm. in this 20 below winter we're seeing. So it, yeah. it's pretty amazing. And we've kept adding to that pile. And it's also the method that you would use to compost dead animals or feathers or any, you throw anything in that pile. I mean, you don't want to put anything in that's highly chemically altered or, you know, if you know something has got a lot of, a lot of medications in it or, you know, <clears throat> that died, it, I wouldn't use that, but, but things that have died pretty naturally, uh, roadkill, whatever in, in yeah. Australia, they're using kangaroos. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, when Jerry was here, he talked about they use this method to compost feral camels and feral kangaroos, which, yeah. you know, it's completely foreign to us. But, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, you can do this with with any carbon based organism, really. Yeah. It, it's and so so just to kind of summarize, you put all these things in, you spray it down with the lactobacillus inoculant. And I know people are asking about more specifics of that and again yep. i don't think we have time to go into that but all of that information is included in these links that we gave you there so please please make sure you look at those watch the videos online uh and then you cover the pile up and yep. it's going to get hot and even after it's kind of gone through that heating phase you still need to let it ferment or grow out just like johnson sue takes yep. about a whole year this this is a similar time frame right yeah it you can repile and make sure all the materials get well mixed, uh, maybe three months in and recover it. And then at, at that, that point, we're out of, you know, our summer was over. So <laughs> we, we just covered it and let it sit till spring. But I took a little bit, about a bucket load of that uh, this spring and, and just put it off to the side. And I really nurtured it along with some oats, threw some oat seed on there, threw a little bit more of that foundational fungi from Elevate on there to get that established and and i use that compost in the garden and that's what i was drawn from to make you know our aerated stuff as well yeah uh, now there's you know it the the method for spice composting is really very similar to the korean natural farming methods yeah. it's just kind of taken some of the complexities and scaled it up to where you yeah. know, anybody can do this with materials that you have. <laughs> yeah, it allows you to do that on a on a larger scale. So Chris is asking, and this is a great question, I think, can you do this in a silage bag? Or do you think would that be too too tight oh, and too that'd restrictive? Be awesome. That'd be awesome. Uh, I'm just trying to think about how you get that little indentation so the water keeps kind of circulating. I don't I don't know if that's totally critical. Because I, we certainly didn't have the best uh, design there, but uh, maybe if you if you built that and filled it, I, it would really be airtight, wouldn't it? Uh, I would think that would heat up and be all right. It might happen pretty fast. Um, yeah, I don't know why why that wouldn't work. It'd be a danger of having it be too wet, just because it it's going to have to have a certain amount of moisture as you start. Yeah. That that would be my concern because in these methods, excess moisture can can yeah. uh, infiltrate through the soil at yeah. the bottom because there's no right. there's no plastic cover on the bottom, right? No, it just kind of yeah. See, so uh, you don't want it laying in a bunch of water. I I think that would get nasty. So yeah, yeah so that that could potentially be the issue there. That's a good question to ask Jerry Gillespie though, uh, and maybe we should follow up on that. I'll yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so. Jack is asking if you, because you mentioned, you know, you get it, you know, it'll freeze and it'll do all that. If you let it freeze, is it going to reduce the fungal component or do you think it just kind of slows the process down? Because 
because like with Johnson Sioux, you know, you're doing that in a tote or on a pallet or whatever. Yeah. You can bring that inside if you want to. Obviously, these piles, you're not moving inside. So it's going to stay outside. It's going to freeze. Do you think that hurts your fungal component or just slows it down? I, I think the microbes know way more, more about how to do this than we do. <laughs> and they'll, they'll be fine. Uh, you know, if something can't withstand the winter in South Dakota, it probably doesn't belong in our soil. Yeah. And, and it'll sort out and it everything will sporulate. And then when conditions are right, moisture, heat, temperature, whatever, they they retake off. And you know, I think I think we just have to really count on on them to do that. And and uh yeah, we might lose some, but I'm not too particularly concerned about individual, you know, species of microbes. It, it's more the, the family, the community that you want as much diversity as you can. And I'm not afraid to, you know, throw a few things in there and see what, what survives and what can benefit me. But largely it's our own biology that we're using from our own material yeah. of our farm. Yeah. And I know, I know Chris Teachout, you know, from Iowa, many of you on this call uh, would know Chris. He lets, he purposely lets his Johnson Sue set outside and freeze be in its exact same theory that you're saying if they can't survive that he doesn't really want them as part of his compost anyway so well, they, they aren't what nature would give it yeah it, it we just, aren't trying to do it better than god did it <laughs> i mean we have our biology that that's there and, and that's what we're trying to propagate right yeah and, and so it just it just takes a little longer uh you know when the temperatures uh are, are going to be variable now uh, and i don't want to open up uh, a can of fish, as it were, here with your hydrolyse. But I know you mentioned earlier when we were talking that you noticed that the hydrolyse process worked much better at a constant temperature. It did. But that's a little bit of a different deal. Can you just in a couple of minutes explain what that hydrolyse process is? Yeah, and I've got as many questions as anybody about it. I took Jerry's methods and went home and tried it. And by golly, the very first batch worked out great. It didn't have a it didn't have a totally offensive odor, put it that way. Uh, and it was kind of a mild summer. I did it in the shade on the north side of the garage. You know, it, so it was seeing some flex, fluctuation in temperature, but it it came out with a pretty nice product. There's all kinds of information on how to make fish hydrolysis uh, on the internet. And I don't know what what's, what's good and what isn't. Uh, you know, re you're really after amino acids and base proteins when you're making any sort of hydrolysis from 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 anything. Uh, so that's what you get out of it. Now, I've had some go bad as well, and I I tried to salvage it, and it's like it's like you know dealing in a cesspool. You know that it's bad. It's it's <laughs> overwhelming. I <laughs> I won't go into it, but. Uh, but the good stuff is really kind of kind of sweet. It's tolerable, or at least I think it's good stuff. It, it it's not an offensive odor. It's got a nice orange color to it. Um, work better with consistent temperatures, like I said. Um, you know, Elaine teaches in her class. Fish hydrolysis is nothing more than chopping up fish and and mixing it with water and using it. There's no fermentation at all. And there's other fish products out there that don't go through mm -hmm. fermentation. Now there's, there's, there's other fish products that have been through a heat cycle and, and yeah. different things. And I, I don't know if I'd be so fond of using those. Yeah. And, and so folks, you know, what, what Jim is really trying to demonstrate here is that, you know, you can buy all these products. You can buy a Johnson Sioux. You can buy all these if you want to, but you can also make them. It's it's not rocket science to do, and so he's you know been demonstrating and proving that you can do this. And it, a hydrolysate typically is using uh, some sort of a protein. Uh, some people do it with pigs. Some people do it with you know fish. You know you're using fish guts. You can use a number of different things, and so that's a whole nother deal. Yeah. So get online, search for that. But that's another option. But it's a completely different end product than what we're talking about with these compost extracts, either from Johnson Sioux, from the spice method, or or the uh, thermophilic, you know, turnpile. The hydrolysis um, is an excellent food source. 
Yes. And it's good to it's, have it's, it in your sprayer when you're putting biology out there. So the, I've heard it, you know, you're sending, you're sending your workers off to work with a lunch bucket. Yeah. So it's, it's not a substitute for those. It's, it's an addition to, it's what ramps it up. So yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, lots of other questions here. Uh, someone is asking here about water. Rhonda is asking about water. Are you using uh, rural water? Do you have to, if you're on rural water and it's got any chlorine in it, how, how, how much of a concern is it with the water source that you're using for wetting your compost? Good question. And I, I am concerned about it. I mean, there's some commercial products you can buy that are relatively cheap that you can add to water to make sure that they don't have any chlorine. Chlorine and chloramine are the two things you want to worry about. Uh, Elaine teaches that all you have to do is add a little humic acid and it'll take care of any issues. Uh, if you start just seeing a tint of color to your water, you're probably that's probably enough. Mm. Um, and, and humic acid can come right out of your worm bin. It's the same thing. That's what you're making with compost is humics. So that's how you can get your own humic acid as well. You don't necessarily have to buy that. Um, the other thing you can do is just bubble that water with the air and, and give it, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes. But before you add the compost. Before you add anything to it. Yeah. And that should bubble that away. Um, and then, you know, kind of watch where your water's coming from. Uh, I sent our water in on our farm that is coming. It's coming from the Missouri River, actually, through a, through a big pipeline uh, that they, you know, is where. So it's pretty good water. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It doesn't have a lot of chlorine in it. Yeah, yeah. But I still, good. you know, go through the steps and make sure you hate to have that be the reason. Yeah. Uh, so Landon has a question about, you know, you talked about you need to have that depression in the top of your spice pile, you know, to let water collect and stuff. He's asking, do you need a hole in the top of the plastic to let water in? Why don't you just explain that a little bit more? Because the, the water is just cycling from the inside. It's not coming yeah. from the outside. It's just kind of daily condensation that collects above that airspace. And then it'll drip back down in and it, it just kind of recirculates through the pile. So it, if you had your moisture fairly consistent throughout the pile when you start, it, you shouldn't have to add much more. It, it just kind of recycles mm -hmm. through. So, so, so really, um, in, in, in a lot of ways, this is less labor intensive and less maintenance than Johnson Sioux because yep. you have to keep that wet at all the time because yep. it's breathing all of that moisture is is transpiring into the air where this is recycling the water because it's yeah. kind of a sealed and method. you're kind of trapping that in there on purpose uh, and and it's a little more efficient as far as uh, output so not so much as getting gassed off as co2 it's kind of staying in there and and the yield is a little better compared to an to a aerobic composting method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I, I remember from that workshop though, you know, because because this is totally different than a lot of things we've been taught. You know, anaerobic is bad, and and uh, and I remember them saying anaerobic is not bad if you have the right organisms in there to begin with. What's bad? is if it starts out as aerobic and then goes anaerobic. But in this situation, we're starting anaerobic, we're adding the right organisms through that inoculant, and, and that's what makes it work, right? Yeah, and like I saw that with, you know, I used some of that in a, and then, and then I used it for a thermophilic. So it kind of went through that anaerobic, then the aerobic. And all of it kind of does look the same, actually, <laughs> at the end of the day, once, it, once it's aerobic again. Now, I, I just, spurred a thought when you mentioned, you know, anaerobic being bad, but uh, most, from what I understand, most of the nitrogen fixing community is, is anaerobic. And, and that's, you know, you think of rhizobium, they build that shell. That's to keep the oxygen out because nitrogen fixing can't happen in the presence of oxygen. So that, that's, you know, very natural for anaerobic processes. Think of a, think of a cow's rumen. And that's the ultimate composter right there. That's all anaerobic. And, and what's happening in a worm, that's anaerobic. Yep. It, it, it's the faculty of microbes that go through that, that are, are really the beneficial guys and the ones we're trying to get that quorum sensing response from. Yeah, that's great. 
So we've got a question all the way from Alaska here. Bryce is asking about the the ratio of compost to water. You know, so when you when you run your extractor, uh, you know, what is the how much compost do you put in versus how many gallons of water, and then how many gallons of that extract do you try to apply to your field? And I'm sure it makes a difference if you're foliar doing it or if you're going in furrow. This is. It's a frustrating because I've been through all this. I want to know exactly well, how much do I need, you know, because it'll drive you nuts trying to figure it out. Well, I want to make sure it's just right. Every compost is different. As long as it has the biological, um, it, you, you can't go wrong, put it that way. Uh, you often hear one pound of compost, one to two pounds of compost per acre, less as you get healthier. Uh, but to start out, I've heard as high as two pounds per acre. So you kind of have to work backwards. How many acres can I spray with a load on my sprayer, however mm -hmm. big it is? And, and uh, you know, how much water is that going to take? And how many acres am I going to cover? So how much compost do I need? And how much do, how much of this uh, basically kind of a concentrate do I need to get in the sprayer and then top it off with water to cover what I want to cover? That's how I think about it. You know, if you start, kind of just thinking a pound to two pounds, we can cover about 40 acres on our, with our sprayer. Uh, well, not quite, but 800 gallon sprayer. And uh, I try to get it full when I go, because you know, you're, you're making the pass. You don't want to go out with half a sprayer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think that's what Dr. Johnson recommends with Johnson Sue is about two pounds of compost per acre. Yeah. And whether you're putting that on with 10 gallons or 20 gallons or whatever you're More doing, that's kind, of, yeah. that's kind of up to your equipment. And some people yeah. even put it on through pivots. And so then at that point, yeah. you know, it's, it's very diluted. So, uh, you know, lots of different ways of, of getting there and getting that. Uh, and and getting it in the furrow. That's, and, and also one or two foliar applications on the plant is what is suggested. And more mm -hmm. if you can, but, you know, yeah, you don't have so much time and so many acres to sure. cover. Right? And, uh, Larry's asking, uh, have you ever added biochar to your compost to get it, get started? Do you see any value in that? Do you have any experiences with biochar? I, the only thing I've done is I emptied the ashes out of our backyard, you know, campfire and and trying to keep it from turning into ash. It shouldn't be even ashes. You know, I kind of try to keep that nice black coal or uh, charcoal like. Mm -hmm. Material. And I've thrown that in there. Won't hurt a thing. Uh, biochar seems as though it uh, it's just more carbon. It's really stable carbon. Uh, it doesn't break down very quickly. Um, kind of creates a place for minerals and nutrients to cling to or chelate. Uh, so it, it can hold on to some things, biology included. But um, you know, I, I don't think it's a bad thing, but I, I wouldn't base my whole agronomy on biochar it, from what I've seen so far. I mean, there might be some other experiences out there. I'm not real knowledgeable on it. Uh, I'm fascinated by it, and I know there's work being done, and maybe there's more to it than, I, than I've than uh, I picked up on. But, you know, it's, it's basically a stable carbon. Yeah. A <laughs> number of questions revolving around earthworms, and of course, we all know that earthworms can be a big part of the Johnson Sioux composting method once it gets through its, uh, the heating phase of that. Uh, you're not really adding any worms or anything in this anaerobic environment, is that correct? Right. Wait till it cools down, and uh, you know, if it's outside and on the ground, they actually, they'll find it. Uh, okay, so I, so when you pull that tarp off before you get ready to use it, you have worms in there that just naturally found it. Yeah, well, I had mine on a wood pallet because I wanted I wanted okay. to be able to to move it or whatever. And but uh, I know people have had it on the ground that you know some of the natural worms will find it different different critters, not just worms, um, you know. But uh, there's all kinds of organisms that'll that'll use it for. For a, for a habitat and create yeah. you know, more air and so, and so you think you earth. could after it after it really got through its hot cycle you could pull that tarp back seed it yeah. with worms and then tarp yeah. it back up again sure okay yeah good, yeah. good mine got a little dry I I, I still kind of you know I'm gonna I'm gonna try it again <laughs> and pay a little more attention to it but 
it, it just really was, uh, uh, I, I don't think I had quite the right balance of coverings and air and, and water. Yeah. And it got tremendously hot yeah. last summer too. So just yeah. hard to yeah. keep up. Well, I know we're up against our hour here, but if you're okay, we'll maybe uh, take a sure. few more questions here. We still got some good questions. Uh, have have several around the, the whole concept of seed treatments. Uh, so number one, are you still using treated seed when you plant your corn and beans on your operation? And then number two, if you're using any type of fungicide seed treatments, is that hurting the fungal populations of, of what you're putting either as a seed treatment yourself on the seed with, with what you're making or the in application? You know, I don't have the the science, there's been science done on it at uh, the ARS lab in, in Brookings, actually. Uh, Michael Lehman did some work with fungicides and seed treatments, and he didn't see a very significant negative effect. However, it is a fungicide. And, yeah. and you know, I, so that's kind of a wishy-washy answer, I know, but I, I'm going to plant some corn on a test plot this year. I found some that was non-treated. Mm -hmm. And I'm just because I want to try that. I want to try to do a full biological approach with with no uh no chemicals we'll see how it goes last year the weeds got me i mean i'll i give <laughs> they beat me last year but we're going to try it again this year so you know these are the problems we have to work through and um you know there's guys doing it that have been very successful doing it and uh as as the system matures and the biological community is healthier and more diverse those weed problems and, and some of the nutritional things become less and less of an issue. Uh, we're still working through that. Yeah. I mean, and we're very much transitional. We don't have this figured out by any means. It's, it's just going to take a lot of experimenting and willing to try and willing to fail actually to go yeah. out there and, and just see how far you can go. Sure. Have you used your, whether it be the Johnson Sioux or the spice extract, have you treated your seeds with it in addition to trying to do in furrow and the foliar feed yeah. as well? I'm using the vermicompost primarily for that. Okay, so you're using uh, the vermicompost. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll make an aerated extraction from the vermicompost, which I, and, then, and then just as we're filling the drill or whatever we're doing, in some cases I've used an old mineral tub and dumped the seed in and sprayed it and and then I've actually thrown in some kelp right with that, uh, mm -hmm. mixing in kelp, you know, raw kelp or, or the, the uh, you know, that you can buy in a bag and, and yeah. just to help fill in some of the space and get all that mixed together. Uh, I don't want to overly wet it if you're using kelp. I found that out because that can kind of or, or keep your, your kelp down. Yeah. But, but yeah, spraying the seed, I think, is the best thing we can do. And then like I said, we're going to try to get more and more of this into the into the furrow. And I'm going to use some Elevate Ag stuff as well, you know, mixing our biology with some of those foods, which uh, you're bringing another level of, uh, you know, uh, microbial response to those foods so that everything is just in as good a condition as we can have it uh, just from the get go with the seed. Yeah. Yeah. And then hopefully we don't need to use, you know, nutritional starters as much. I'm going to use more of a biological starter. And then if it appears we have some uh, nutritional issues of some sort, then we can always apply that with a foliar if we need to. Yep. So uh, Jetta is asking, have you seen anybody using again either this or maybe johnson sioux extract on pastures you know on perennial grasses have you done any of that do you are you aware of people doing that and what kind of increase in production are they seeing on that uh it works in anything uh from what they teach in the soil food web school that once you get the right biology in the soil your plants are going to respond to that um, some of the issues with hayland or compaction and, you know, the grazing, the, there's so many management things that come into play yeah. in anything, you know, there's management issues that probably are going to have a bigger impact from, you know, that you have to be thinking about that, okay, this happened, or this is what we used to do, or, 
you know, and, you know, but the, the microbe community starts building that soil aggregation in the airspace and they start giving them a chance to do what they do, which is to build soil aggregates. And if we're destroying that all the time, it just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. We gotta, we gotta allow them that opportunity as often as we can. So uh, one of the microbes I've just recently learned this is that the lactobacillus stuff is really, really good at creating those aggregates. So that's why that's often, uh, you know, kind of the basis of the Korean farming natural method is, is getting that particular microbe doing that work early on. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to kind of wrap it up. We're going to kind of bring this thing in for a landing here. We've got, uh, we, we <laughs> continue the discussion for quite some time. Uh, really grateful for everybody that uh, jumped on and participated to ask questions. Uh, again, we will send out all of these links. We'll send out the questions and the, uh, that, that people asked here. Uh, we appreciate everybody jumping in and joining. Uh, next week, we're going to have David Olson on. Uh, uh, Jim, you mentioned some of the foundational fungi products uh, that we sell through Elevate Ag. Well, those are being made by David Olson. And so he's going to talk a little bit more about that. And, and this is going to be more of a, uh, of a product that you can purchase that is going to be very, very high in, in the fungal component, because that's the hardest thing to do yeah. uh, with the biology. So make sure you join us for that. We'd love to have you back for that. And before we let everybody go, I do, I do want to just mention one more thing about Jim that, that is, I think, really fascinating, very exciting to me. Uh, he has a book that's going to be published here very soon, and it's it's not necessarily a book about composting, but it's a book about really regenerating God's creation, both the soil as well as the soul. And so, Jim, you sent that to me, gosh, I don't know, it's six, nine months ago to read, and I just loved it. And I said, why aren't you publishing this? <laughs> and so now you are. So tell us a little bit, you know, just in the next two minutes, tell us about Farmers of Light. Yeah, um, it, it just was on my heart. Uh, you know, I'd been to all these conferences and listening to all these discussions about soil health, and I could just see this comparison of, uh, of the soil and the soul and how these principles kind of align. And I just started collecting my thoughts. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh, yeah, I could. You know, so I just started writing. And, and collecting and, and pretty soon gala I had quite a bit of content put together and and then I thought well I could actually organize that a little bit into maybe you know <laughs> some some uh, a readable book form and and of course I sent it to a few folks like yourself that encouraged me and thank you for that I it is it is going to be published from what I understand I've seen the you know kind of the first first go and then we're going to make some corrections and fix and things yeah. but it should be out soon i'm so, excited about it. so folks when that comes out we'll make sure you know we'll, we'll be uh we'll be letting people know where they can order that and how they can get that but it's going to be a great uh kind of a personal devotional book a, a great study connecting the the our souls to the soil so i think you'll enjoy it uh jim thank you so much uh, we really appreciate it. And folks, if you missed any of this, we will have the recording on our YouTube channel uh, relatively soon. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that. And then anytime we post something new, uh, you'll get an alert for that. So thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, come back next week uh, when we'll be talking with David Olson. Thank you. Thanks, Jim.